All right. Well, good day, everyone. We want to welcome you to PrimePay's uh, 2019 webinar series. Today's webinar is titled PrimePay's Guide to Retirement Plans. Uh, we want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to sit with us today. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Steve Jackson, and I'm the Senior Vice President of our Broker Concierge Program here at PrimePay, and I actually am just thrilled at being able to deliver this great content for you here today. Uh, before we get started, uh, why don't we go just kind of cover some of the logistics. We, even though we have muted everyone's lines today, your phone lines, and believe me, you'll thank me. There's a lot of folks on, and so that enables a, a much a greater experience. But so, but just because your lines are muted um, doesn't mean that we do not want to hear from you. And so, if you have questions throughout the specific content, you know that is uh, stated here throughout the webinar today, we would like to hear from you. And you can go into uh, it. Uh, you can ask questions a couple different ways. Uh, one is to go directly into the GoToMeeting uh, menu bar. There's a question box. And throughout my presentation today, um, if anything comes up that you have a question on, go ahead and type in your question, okay? Um, and um, you can do that at any time throughout the webinar. Now, for those of you who want to ask a question using Facebook or Twitter, you're going to see a hashtag on most of the slides. You'll see one there in the lower right-hand corner. And all you need to do to ask a question, you can utilize Facebook and Twitter, just use the hashtag PrimePay. 401k, all right, and we will do our best to answer those questions. So I may be able to answer those questions throughout the webinar, but if if not, uh, we will have our own Prime Pay subject matter experts connect with you directly after the webinar today to provide you with those answers. So we do want to hear from you. Now, the most popular question that is asked is, Steve. I would love a copy of the recording. <laughs> are you recording this? The answer is yes. We are recording the webinar here today. Uh, we do post those after each and every webinar. Uh, in our follow-up email to you, we will include a copy of the link to the recording. And also, you will receive a copy of the presentation deck itself, all right? So I think that will cover the logistics here, at least right now. So why don't we go ahead and actually dive into our content here for today. All right. Oh, and there I am. You don't want to look uh, too too much on, on that picture there. All right. So let's move into our agenda. Now, let me say this. Prime Pay is passionate about retirement plans. Um, we have seen a real desire by many of our prime pay clients to, to look at either gaining more knowledge about this specific uh, type of benefit program that you as an employer could instill for your employees and for your company, um, but also those employers who have a plan and are just considering greater options. And, and this here in the month of August, it is a very prudent time of the year to be able to look if for those of you who have or offer a retirement plan to consider the various key ingredients, all right, that make up your specific plan that you offer your employees. But I will also say this, is that a great number of you that are on this webinar today, many of you do not offer retirement plan benefits to your employees. And so the, the agenda today, the content today is really made for both of you, okay? Uh, for those of you who are considering a retirement plan for your company, I think you're going to find these four areas of focus and the trends, I think, very valuable in your decision-making process. For those of you who have a retirement plan today, I think you're going to be very interested in understanding, okay, I, I may need to be performing certain functions or I may need to put my eyes in certain areas of focus specific to the retirement plan that I am offering today. And so today, we've kind of broken this up into two areas, uh, three as a wrap-up. But the first, I think it's important to talk about specific trends, um, that, um, that current trends that are currently happening in retirement planning. Uh, in this area, I think it's important for you to kind of see um, a greater stage well outside of just you and your employee base, right? So let's, let's look at some current trends. And then I've focused this webinar content into four areas of focus. 
And those four areas then would be centered on the investment side, the cost, compliance, and then I'm going to hone in on some key deadlines that you just want to consider, whether you are looking at a retirement plan for the first time or whether you currently have a plan and, uh, you know, you need to understand these specific deadlines that may be impacting uh, your plan today. And then our third area here today then will be just to wrap up. All right. So, again, as I go throughout today's um, slides and the content, um, please feel free to type in your question. Uh, you can go into that go to meeting menu bar, that question box, and type that in at any time. All right. So let's first let's go into trends in retirement planning. Now, now I'm going to show this first one, and some of you might say, "Well, Steve, you're starting out with such a negative, <laughs> negative slide here showing some metrics." But I think it's important to kind of showcase a couple things, and I, believe me, there will be some positive <laughs> out of all this. Um, the first metric or current trend that I want to show you is uh, this came from the Federal Reserve Report on the Economic Well-Being of U.S. Households, and this was just published here in May of 2019. And I thought it interesting. Okay, you see there, uh, it, from left to right, you have age groups, okay? So in individuals that are aged 18 to 29, and, and there's four different categories here that go to 60 or over age, those individuals aged 60 or over there on the far right. In the gray, it represents those individuals in that age category that have no retirement savings whatsoever. All right. In the purple, it just showcases that these individuals have some retirement savings. And I'll, and I'll put a little more commentary to that here in another slide. But what, what you see there, if we go to the far right, the positive is, right, I think as you guys look at this, uh, for those age 60 or over, 87% of those individuals have some type, some amount of retirement savings uh, that's that they have put together for themselves and for their households. Okay, that is good news. But we still have 13% of those 60 or over that do not. Okay, and then we go to the other side, to the left side of this slide, where we look at the millennials, right? And and over 42% of the millennials aged 18 to 29, they have absolutely no retirement savings whatsoever, and about 58% of them have some retirement savings. So I want you to look at this here for a second. Even those of you who may have retirement plans that you offer, you know, it is also very much about education. And, you know, you also might want to look at the level of participation, right, um, of those employees, of your population of employees that are actually participating in your plan. You know, millennials have a lot of reasons, right, why they may not save for retirement. It may just be that retirement is four decades away, <laughs> and so it's not even on their brains. Or you can also see a lot of research that a lot of these millennials have a tremendous amount of student loan debt, right, college debt that they're trying to pay off, um, and that is also going to hugely impact their decision to be able to put money in other areas. So I also want you to think about, just think about this a second before I move on to the next slide. Think about the amount of matching employer contributions that are also being left off the table. That free money, if you will, from an individual by not even participating in an employer-sponsored plan. It's estimated that by a company called Financial Engines that over $24 billion is unclaimed each year. Uh, by employees, all right? So while a very positive slide, this slide has some very strong negative, um, uh, you know, connotations to it as well. So let's go here to the next slide. There was a, a, a survey, and this comes out yearly by uh, EBRI and uh, Greenwald Retirement Confidence Survey, and they stated here that 40% of those surveyed, and this is specific to retirement confidence. So you as an individual, are you confident in your retirement? So 40% of those surveyed stated that they have fewer than $25,000 between household savings and investments. Um, so pretty telling, right? Actually, in a uh, kind of a corresponding Northwestern Mutual study, it found that one in three Americans has less than $5,000 saved up for retirement. <laughs> 
So we understand that there's uh, uh, some, some issues here with the ability to save. When we think about retirement, right? Think about the cost of retirement, just the cost of being in retirement, and that's going to include, you know, healthcare related costs, but just ongoing cost, right? To, to live your life through retirement, it costs a lot of money. So it's important that we enable employees to have access to additional savings options. Another statistic uh, that came out, and, and this came out from LIMRA, uh, LIMRA Research, um, they said that just four in 10 small businesses offered retirement benefits. And that was for employers that had fewer than 100 employees in the company. So four out of 10 employers do not offer benefits today. Um, it, it's important to understand that if, if you think you as an owner or, you know, you joining here today, you're in some capacity there as, uh, as an employee, maybe within your employer basis, you think about you personally, right? You want or wish to have money saved for retirement. You personally have that goal, that objective. You want to, in some way or another, have at least somewhat of a nest egg, right? But here, a lot of small employers, four out of 10, have decided, you know, we're not going to offer retirement plans for some rhyme or reason, right? So think about this. Many states have decided to take a proactive approach in this measure. Given that four out of 10 small businesses are not um, offering retirement plan benefits to their employees today, states are looking at their own personal future costs right? Uh, those employees who have not uh, been able to create a nest egg or somewhat of a nest egg for themselves um, by the, you know, by their retirement uh, age year, well, guess what? Their ability then to um, actually access or need or require more state resources, they're going to consume them, right? And so some states, and actually more are coming, states have actually taken this into their own hands. And there are currently 10 states that have passed legislation stating that if you are a, an employer of a certain size, and so <laughs> just think small employer from five employees on up, these states have mandated that you as an employer must offer a retirement plan in some form or fashion, meaning they've required it. So in California and Connecticut, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington, these states right now have passed legislation um, stating that you must have a retirement plan or face some penalties. OK, now there are probably a dozen or so other states. I, I decided not to list them here today, but a dozen or more states actually have legislation that is proposed to do exactly what these 10 states have already enacted. OK, so what are the benefits? Right. Uh, you see there. I mean, generally, they are uh, uh, mandating that there is a three percent employee contribution. It's mandatory. OK, so as an employer, if you if you yourself do not wish to adopt your own personal 401k or 457 or 403b type of retirement plan for your employees, then these states have actually created their own retirement plan. And it, and it looks like it very much acts and usually is an IRA. It can be a Roth IRA or traditional IRA type of a plan, generally like a Roth IRA. And so with this, if you yourself as an employer say, hey, I'm not, I am not going to implement a retirement plan at this time, if you're part of these states, you will have to offer retirement plans. So the state would say, well, use ours, use the one that we have or we, we are recommending. And so what the state would say is that the employee would be uh, required to uh, mandatorily uh, deduct 3% of their salary, uh, salary, hourly rate as an employee contribution into the IRA. So this is a really good thing, right? This forces the initial stage of beginning to build their nest egg. So that is really a great benefit. But then you might ask, well, okay, what are these states doing? I mean, what kind of cost is there? Well, really from an employer standpoint, there's really little to no cost 
uh, to you, the employer. Um, you know, there's certainly a time, maybe commitment, if you will, where you as an employer needs to coordinate the payroll deductions um, specific, you know, to those individuals and into that state plan. Um, but, um, you know, and then there can be potentially uh, penalties or cost for noncompliance. All right, and that does vary. What we have noticed is that these states may not have necessarily began to enforce all of the rules around this, but I would say that that is coming. You're going to see more states uh, beginning to enforce this rule here in 2020 than in no other time. All right. So it, it now with the state mandated retirement plan uh, plans, um, they're not as comprehensive. They're not going to give you exactly everything that you would want to give for your employees. It's not going to meet probably the various vast diverse needs of your employee base. Okay. So, but it is a starting point. It does get something started for you, which is a very good thing. But if you would like to have an employer match, you know, if you want to have something more for your highly compensated employees or officers and owners and so forth of the company, then you're probably going to want to look at more of the traditional 401k or safe harbor 401k plans where the contribution limits are that much greater uh, than what you're able to do specifically through these state mandated retirement plans. There's one other piece of current trends that I definitely want to mention uh, to you here today. And this is proposed legislation that was unanimously, actually, well, ha, close to <laughs> unanimously approved in the House. So it is now, this bill has now gone into the Senate. Now, due to the August recess, uh, they are certainly not acting on it here right now, but it is expected um, to be discussed and hopefully voted on here very soon by the Senate, and then ultimately, once approved, would go in front of the president. So this is new proposed legislation, So, and this is called the SECURE Act, and I, and I want you to think about this vein of, okay, we have individuals who need money for their retirement, and yet we have very few, actually, if you look at that percentage across the board in those four categories, uh, it's probably somewhere around 30% of individuals here in America are, have no money saved for retirement whatsoever, right? So just, it, <laughs> that, that's not going to get to our goal. So the, the government is seeing that there are many requirements with retirement plans, that employers are kind of stuck to some degree with these rigid types of requirements. And so I, I highlighted six things within this SECURE Act where the House of Representatives passed this bill, at least initially here, now it goes to the Senate, um, and it covers six areas that would kind of alleviate some issues that have been there for employers. You guys are probably familiar with pooling plans, uh, maybe multiple employer type plan arrangements. Uh, you see this in the conversation about healthcare, uh, where businesses can pool together, come together, and form a multiple employer plan for their healthcare needs, right? So, so what they're proposing here now is multiple employer plans where small businesses can form together, all right, across all sorts from different states, different industries, but they can come together and be able to have a retirement plan that would be available to all of those employers that fall or uh, participate in that plan. There's been some legislation in the past, though, that um, kind of prohibited employers from acting in that capacity. But this legislation specifically insulates businesses um, from penalties for other members' violations. Um, you know, violations of fiduciary rules and, and other areas. And so it has relaxed or has certainly increased the appeal of employers to join these multiple employer plans for the sole purpose of being able to provide a retirement plan. That's really a good thing for you as a business owner that just, oh gosh, you know, I have to choose what type of plan I'm going to get into, the investments. You know, you, in this case, you as an employer could join a multiple employer plan and be able to have maybe some of those certain aspects already taken care of for you. There's also new tax credits. Um, you might have been aware that if you were a business that did not have a retirement plan and now implemented a new retirement plan that there was a tax credit of $500 sitting there for you. Hey, how about that? Well, with this new proposed legislation, that would increase to $5,000. And there's another credit out there that's $500 that if you as a business 
adopt an automatic enrollment for the plan, you would actually receive another $500 tax credit. And automatic enrollment would be where you as a business, when you've adopted your uh, retirement plan, that you've ma basically made it a requirement. You as a new hire, you're now eligible for the retirement plan. You're automatically enrolled. You're automatically going to start a deferral, you know, of your salary into the investments. Next is small business flexibility. As I mentioned before, a lot of the rules for 401ks and retirement plans, they're rigid, right? Restrictive. You know, once you've started in a plan for the year, you can't really make many changes. And so the small business flexibility comes in where they've allowed for provisions to include mid-year changes and to kind of relax uh, some of those restrictions that have been put in place before. Also, new annuity-based rules. You know, many plans have tended to stay away from annuities um, just over the past, over concerns about the liability involved in choosing an annuity provider. But there's, uh, through this proposed legislation, there's updated safe harbor provisions that would allow you to select an annuity provider in a, in a really a, a better way, an easier way, or I'd say a more comfortable way to, to kind of lessen some of that potential liability concerns. I like this next one, greater flexibility with part-time employees. Um, the current threshold for eligibility is where an employee needs to complete at least a thousand hours of service in a year, okay? And you're now eligible, right? If you're that type of an employee, you're eligible to uh, be able to participate in our retirement plan. Um, under this legislation that's proposed, that would be reduced to 500 hours. And what they saw was they recognized that you as a business owner may have um, a lot of good longer term part time employees, right? We all do. And, and so this would be a way as long as they have 500 hours and that is a spread over, I'm sorry, uh, who completes that number of hours in three consecutive years. OK, so it is for the longer term part time employees that would allow those employees then those part time employees to participate. And then lastly, this removal of age limitations on IRA contributions. Um, currently, within IRAs, traditional IRAs, it bars contributions once you hit a certain age, 70 and a half, all right? But by removing those, this um, age limitation now, it provides for greater or a, a greater amount of options for these individuals to be able to contribute even outside of the retirement plan that they may have with their employer. All right. So that's certainly think about some of these current trends. There's some really good things. I mean, bottom line, I think we all would have a consensus, right, um, that we want our employees to be able to be able to have access to a um, to a vehicle that would enable them to save money, right? And so we can talk about all the tax implications, right? I mean, there's some great tax reasons, the employer contributions, matching contributions that can be there. But what we're finding here in these trends is that employers need to provide greater access and greater education, you know, to, um, re to their retirement plan programs. All right, so today, I want to cover just four areas of focus. And again, whether you are offering a retirement plan today or are considering to offer, these are going to be four areas of importance for you as you make ongoing decisions for your company. And so the first area of focus, I have uh, put this into, into the four, and the first one here being the investment analysis. Um, Past performance is not indicative of future results, right? You've heard that phrase be made multiple times if you are in investments. Um, and uh, so what you currently see in an investment return um, doesn't guarantee that in the next 12 months you're going to see, see that same very return here once again, right? So it is important as you are implementing a retirement plan for the first time, or you currently offer retirement plan, that you do an honest assessment, which is more of a portfolio review, the, the performance review of the investments that you are choosing. 
as the plan sponsor of a retirement plan, you would be considered the fiduciary, right? And I'll explain that here in another slide. But the fiduciary of choosing those investments. So it's important for you to be able to uh, kind of uh, benchmark your investments, the investment offering or portfolio that's in your plan. You need to benchmark that with uh, maybe the, say, uh, indices such as the S&P 500 index, right? The Dow Jones Industrial Index, the NASDAQ index, uh, medium-sized company indexes, so small company indexes, things of that nature. You need the scorecard of options, if you will, a report of that. If you're just uh, enacting a, a retirement plan for the first time, you're going to want to gauge your performance and not just look at the last 12 months of overall performance but look at the performance based on, on how does that compare uh, from a benchmarking aspect to other various benchmarks that are important um, you know, to the markets and certainly to your employees. So portfolio review, this is something that should be done annually if you currently have a retirement plan. It's important for you to monitor this and maintain uh, fiduciary responsibilities with your portfolio each and every year. Just to break down the investment options just a bit further, though, for you, some of you might be in certain options, and this is just to gauge kind of where things uh, are kind of are going, right? So annuities, I mentioned in that SECURE Act that there's probably uh, going to be at least uh, some relaxing of some of the, the liability uh, applications here as it relates to annuities, and many uh, plan providers, many employers choose annuities. Uh, they are great uh, investments. They can be. Uh, they provide such great opportunities for an employee to select multitude amount of, of investments within that annuity, and there are some greater protections by having some annuities in place, okay, uh, as an investment option. So that's one option, and uh, but another option that's certainly very popular is just going the straight mutual fund route, right? And, and many of you that may have gone in this direction have chosen a particular fund family. Um, you know, Fidelity is a very large um, mutual fund family. There's others, right, called Vanguard. There's others called um, the American Fund right? I mean, there's, there's really good fund families. And as you as an employer, as you're looking at your investment analysis, you may want to choose not only just a variety of mutual funds, right, from various different family of funds, but you may want to spe uh, specifically choose a family such as the American funds or Vanguard or Fidelity and be able to just choose from their various options. Now, you want to be uh, conscientious when you're making that decision because fund families can be limited. Um, it depends, right? So you want to choose a fund family that is going to uh, really provide the full breadth of asset allocation that you would need, the risk rewards, right, that you and your employees would need. A very popular investment option are age-based funds or otherwise known as target date funds. And in a recent Fidelity research report uh, that reflected their first quarter of 2019, I found this really interesting. 52% of the individuals had their 401k savings in target date funds. So you may ask, well, what is a target date fund again? Target date is, is a mutual fund that, that allocates your money in the fund based on a specific future date, which would be generally a retirement date. It could also be used in a college savings environment. So if you've participated in a 529 plan, you could choose a target date fund. And so you could say, well, my child is going to be going to college in 2025. Um, and you just invest your money. You don't have to worry about allocating anything. But that money will go from risky investments to very conservative investments when it's time for you to start taking money out for college. Same thing here for retirement. You have a retirement date of 2030, right? Well, 
I, I don't have a lot of time to spend in trying to figure out how I should allocate my funds. So I'm just going to put my money in these target date fund so that it knows I'm retiring in 2030 and I want to make sure that that money is not at risk you know, when I need to go maybe taking money out of that fund here in after 2030. So I was very um, uh, actually, uh, you know, encouraged to hear that Fidelity was reporting that over half of their individuals actually had their money in these funds. Another future, I would say something that's growing and growing out there today too, it's a very cheap alternative to investments. Uh, we have many employ uh, many uh, individuals that want to invest in the S&P 500, you know, certain indices uh, that are available out there, but they want to do it very cheaply. And exchange-based funds, or ETFs, are also ways um, to be able to invest in broader indices with a very little amount of money. So you get your money really allocated really well. It's very well balanced, but you can also do it very inexpensively. So the first one there is investment analysis. The second is cost. Um, this is important. And, and again, if you have um, a, if you're currently in a retirement plan, you're going to want to review the cost each and every year. And, and, and I want you as an employer to consider all the cost of a retirement plan when making your decision. You know, you should consider not only those costs or fees or expenses that you would pay as an employer, but also those that are borne by the employee, right? Because an employer that is adopting a retirement plan, in many cases, you can establish it so that you as an employer have very little expenses. But guess what? That means that the employee, someone, is going to be paying, you know, um, for the mutual fund, uh, you know, money manager so that they can allocate funds or paying a commission to an investment advisor or, or fees to a record keeper or, or to a third party administrator, right? That's going to be there. But the costs are these, and I just want to break it down for those of you who may not have uh, implemented a retirement plan so you get a sense of, of what uh, is included. So from an employer basis, some of the hard costs um, are going to include really, you know, generally a monthly administrative fee. And these are usually uh, broken down by a, uh, a per employee or per account based fees, okay? And these are generally monthly administrative fees and these are ongoing as you would implement your retirement plan. Now, there can be other additional costs, hard costs like 5500 filing. Um, you may, basically, if, if a document needed to be amended, uh, you know, there could be specific costs or hard costs specific to that. Many times the monthly administrative fees might cover some of those but not always. So just be conscientious in regard to those specific hard costs. And then you just have the cost of doing business, right? And I, and I just put this more into the compliance risk side of the cost analysis. Um, retirement plans, if you have a 401k, a 403b, um, you know, those are considered ERISA qualified plans. And so under ERISA, you're going to need to perform the specific requirements under ERISA. And that's, that's distributing certainly plan documents, so the communication aspects of it, but also acting as a fiduciary. You're going to have specific fiduciary roles and responsibilities and also a bonding requirement that would be available um, or that would, that would be part of that as well for you. So the cost, um, and I'm not going to dive into the specific costs, they can range all over the place, um, but honestly can be very inexpensive to an employer on an ongoing basis. From an employee basis, the cost analysis uh, could be in the case of a simple IRA, okay, uh, type of an environment, they could, there could potentially be some upfront cost or surrender fees that could be in place for the employee or, um, but there's generally investment management fees. That's the expense ratios, you know, so if that employee is going to contribute dollars into their specific mutual funds or investments, those mutual funds are going to carry expenses that would be taken directly out of the assets 
uh, that they were that would that they put their money in. Okay, and so those investment management fees then go to pay uh, the investment advisor. They pay the mutual fund companies, uh, the record keepers, the third party administrators. Uh, those individuals involved in processing uh, that aspect. So it's going to be important for you to to uh, review that. Now, I want to talk about the compliance analysis, and then we're going to talk about some key deadlines that will touch more into the specific cost aspects of this. The compliance analysis is important. Um, when you adopt a retirement plan, you're going to, um, it, it will automatically create under ERISA fiduciary responsibilities. And I, and I put a quote in here that's directly out of the ERISA uh, regulations. You know, anyone that's acting in the capacity of performing fiduciary functions is a fiduciary under ERISA. So you might say, Steve, wait, wait, what are you talking about? Okay. You know, if you are an employer, that is now offering a retirement plan for the benefit of your employees and their dependents, right? That generally is going to constitute an ERISA qualified plan. Are you as an employer exercising discretionary authority over the management of the plan? You know, are, are you amending the plan? Are you changing plan options? Are you selecting the type of benefits that are going to be offering? You know, are you um, just uh, exercising authority over plan administration and so forth? So in those capacities, you are becoming a fiduciary. All right. And so the compliance aspect is very important. You need to take um, a stronger sense of responsibility then in regard to the overall retirement plan that you are offering. And that's why I say that investment analysis side and the cost analysis side is very important and it's something for you to be performing on an ongoing but but certainly annual type of basis on a compliance and uh side of the equation as well is you also want to look at the timely processing of payroll deductions now we get this question quite a bit hey okay um i have employees who are deducting you know they're taking money out of their paycheck you know and these are dollars set aside these are deductions for their 401k or for their retirement plan when do i need to get that money in those uh, 401k accounts well the real answer is as soon as possible uh you know what the irs is ultimately looking for is that you need to be take take every means reasonably uh you know that's reasonable right uh, with your company to be able to get those dollars in those in the plan as quickly as possible which we're literally talking a day or two later right i mean it's it's as soon as possible now for employers um, that are have have fewer than 100 participants the department of labor has provided a seven business day safe harbor rule okay so that in essence gives you seven business days they basically said okay all right look we, we can understand administratively sometimes there there can be certainly some issues um so we'll you know as long as you do it within seven business days at the end of the day we're we got you covered okay in any audit you're going to be fine all right with that um, but um, you have this what's called a maximum deadline and I want to emphasize that it's not a safe harbor okay and what this maximum deadline states is that um, that contributions have to be uh, deposited into the plan into the account no later than the 15th business day of the month following the month in which the contribution was deducted now what what is stated here within the department of labor and you know the irs is is that you know look uh it, it is it says the 15th business day but the real answer as i stated before is really as soon as possible and uh we've had employers that have uh, been audited and what they're going to look for even if you meet that 15th business day of the month following the month in which the contribution was deducted they're going to be looking for things, right? And they're going to be looking for employers that are making any operational mistakes or if they're making any prohibited transactions, all right? And so um, if you find that you're currently making contributions well, well past the seven business days, but well past the 15th business days, you need to look at your current practices, all right? The Department of Labor maintains a voluntary fiduciary correction program. And that may be used to resolve some of the prohibited transactions. So if you find yourself well beyond that, 
you probably you you're probably in a stance of a prohibited transaction and so you're going to want to make sure you get that corrected here uh, sooner rather than later the last item here in compliance analysis is you want to ensure that you are performing the 5500 filing each year all employers must file uh, this each year. Now, you may be, I don't know, on the call here today, if you happen to have a solo, it's called a solo 401k, it's kind of like for sole proprietors. If you have fewer than 250000 in assets, you would not be required to file a 5500 filing, but that's going to be a very few of you. So, so really, all of you would need to file Form 5500 filing uh, would be a key requirement. So that's going to move here into the key deadlines. Number four, in our areas of focus here for you today. The 5500 filing is a, is a filing that goes to or through, right, the Department of Labor, the IRS, it's IRS Form 5500, all right? And it basically tells the IRS that you have a plan, it provides details as to assets in the plan, um, the number of participants, a lot of good information, right, uh, that the IRS would ultimately need. Um, and, um, and so you would file that each year. And the due date is the last day of the seventh month after the end of your plan year. So for those of you with calendar years, you would be required to file by the end of July. Now there is an extension uh, and you would need to file that extension before the end of that July or that last day of the seventh month. And that would branch you an additional two and a half months, okay? But the end of the day, your due date is the last day of the seventh month after the end of your plan year that it would need to be filed. Now, many times your, your TPA, your administrator, um, would be helping you and assisting and supporting your efforts in that area, all right? But do ensure, please review uh, this so that it is being taken care of on an annual basis. And then you have this other annual requirement as well, and that's the non-discrimination testing. And in the basic uh, definition of non-discrimination testing, right, the IRS came out and said, hey, look, we want to make sure that the benefit that you're providing is not benefiting the highly compensated employees more than the non-highly compensated employees, right? <laughs> we want you to favor the non-highly compensated employees. And so the IRS said, look, employers, you need to perform a non-discrimination test each year, all right, to ensure that your plan passes each and every year, that it's being passed as a non-discriminatory plan. Now again, your TPA, your, your administrator, uh, might be performing these functions with you. Um, there are various plans. Uh, there's a plan called a Safe Harbor 401k, which actually enables you um, to maybe avoid some of that non-discrimination testing if you adhere to some of the employer matching contribution requirements that's within a safe harbor 401k. So there are options out there for you to avoid some of that testing procedure that may be there here today. Another key, some key deadlines here as well, is around distribution of notices. You know, many of these plans are under ERISA. They're ERISA qualified. So ERISA is going to dictate what type of communication needs to be distributed, right, to employees. If you think about ERISA, I know some of you might go, oh, Steve, ERISA, all these requirements that they make us perform, right? Yeah, yeah I'm totally, you know, preaching to the choir, <laughs> you know, there for sure. But, but the premise, right, of ERISA was the ability to say, look, you as an employer, if you're adopting this plan, this retirement plan, we want you to communicate, we want you to be transparent to your employees about your plan, right? Don't not, not only educate them about the investments and what your plan offers, but really tell them about the details of your plan, the eligibility, the, the fees, the, the, you know, the, um, um, the applications of the investments, the mutual funds, um, you know, what, what will it take if I need to uh, leave the employer? What if I terminate employment, right? What, all of these questions that would surface to an employee so that they can make um, you know, uh, solid decisions in their, uh, you know, for their, for themselves and for their family. And so there's, there's five items here that I just list here as distribution of notices that you want to be very conscientious of. The summary and report is actually uh, distributed once a 5500 filing has been made. So if you are uh, performing a 5500 filing, you then would be required to uh, create and distribute a summary annual report. 
And it's basically, think of this, it's really the summary of the IRS Form 5500. And you need to distribute this report um, to the employees within nine months after the close of the plan year. Okay, so, um, you know, so generally if your calendar year plan, you're looking somewhere in that September, right, time frame as to when you're going to need to distribute your summary and your report. Again, your TPA, your administrator will, uh, may, uh, you know, certainly assist your efforts there in regard to that particular report. There are also a couple fee disclosure notices. One of those notices go to the employer, and it's called the 408B2. Ah, getting technical on you there. Sorry about that. But that's one that would go to the employer. And then there's also a notice that goes to the employee, and that's called the 404A5 disclosure. And I just want you to think of these things as an employer you want to have as much information as you can get, right, about the plans, fees, and the investments, right? Just kind of know everything there is to know about it. And then also think about your employees. Your employees will want to have that same type of information. You know, because once you understand all the plan services that surround your retirement plan and you've verified, you know, your status, right, the fiduciary status of the advisor and you as a plan sponsor, you're going to need to document those plan fees and, and ensure that they're reasonable in light of the services that are being provided. Right. So so it's important to be able to provide these fee di disclosure notices to your employees annually. Also, you have a qualified default investment alternative notice. Say what, Steve? All right. The QDIA notice. I talked about education there a little bit. You know, we, we certainly need to be able to do more in providing valuable education to employees so that they can make better decisions. Right. As it relates to retirement plans. But hey, investments, understanding which mutual funds are the right fit for uh, me personally at any given time, I don't know. I don't understand it, right? So employers um, actually uh, provide a qualified default investment alternative. And this would be the default investment that um, as an employee, if they chose no specific option, you know, mutual fund or investment option, that the funds would be automatically sent into this default investment alternative. And basically, the DOL has provided four types um, of, of vehicles here for this. You know, one is one that I talked about before, which is that target date fund or the life cycle fund. You know, and that offers that mix of investments that take into account the individual's age, you know, or their retirement date, right? So that's that's a great uh, one to choose as a default uh, investment. It could also be investment um, investments that are professionally managed, uh, you know, by an advisor, and they're automatically managing the accounts. There are also products that could be um, considered um, as qualified default investments um, that could be balanced funds and also capital preservation products uh, or investment accounts that could be used. Think like money market accounts or, or funds that carry no risk whatsoever. They have a nominal interest rate of return, uh, but uh, you know would not carry a lot of risk. That's what that qualified default investment alternative. You need to provide a notice and 60 days uh, prior to you naming or changing their qualified default investment alternative, you need to provide a specific notice to that effect. Next is the safe harbor notice. And uh, this is this needs to be provided at least 30 days, but not more than 90 days uh, prior to the beginning of the plan year. And a safe harbor notice needs to be provided every year. And so just think of this safe harbor notice as the key notice that's going to provide uh, it in writing of all the employees' rights and obligations under their plan. And then the last item here that's very important is the document restatement deadlines. Now, I guess if you think about this, as a, a plan sponsor, as an employer who has adopted a retirement plan for your company, you're going to need to be able to show that you've timely adopted a written plan document, that it is up to date with any necessary amendments to reflect, you know, existing or current uh, or new tax law changes, 
and that the plan document complies with the form uh, requirements of the Internal Revenue Code, right? Now, how are you, uh, per se, you know, to know, well, I don't know, is my, is my document always current, you know? And uh, so what the IRS has actually created is a cycle in which these document restatements are to be made. And basically what they've stated is that every six years, for pre-approved plans, meaning a boilerplate, you know, IRS has, um, you know, approved the model documents notices for these retirement plans. And if you choose that pre-approved plan, um, you just need to restate your documents every six years. If you have a customized plan, meaning you're kind of going outside of the realm of what the IRS has already approved, then you must restate that every five years. Now, the last restatement that was made was in April of 2016. So that means the next cycle of document restatement will be set for April 2022. So again, not an annual requirement, but every six years, uh, if, if you're using pre-approved plans, that new document will need to be uh, restated and then distributed out to the employees. So I covered a lot there, right? Um, I mean, covered quite a bit there in regard to uh, these four areas. And, and we do need to get probably pretty granular on many of those areas. But what I hope you would see that over these, uh, these four key areas, whether you have a plan in place already, or if you're thinking about um, actually, uh, if you're thinking about actually adding a retirement plan to your company here, you know, very shortly, I want you to think about just a few more things here. I mean, these four areas really enable you to make stronger decisions, um, you know, in this process. So I want you to think about retirement plans in this way. You know, the tight labor market that we find, you know, ourselves in today, the unemployment rates at the lowest in, you know, in, in almost centuries, right? Um, so this tight labor market is making it more difficult for you to find labor, to find new candidates, um, and also, your diverse workforce that you have currently, your current employee base, is really demanding more benefits, right? Enhanced benefits. Um, and so, you do need to consider enhancing your benefit program today. So, if you're not offering a retirement plan, a retirement plan actually is a, is a very inexpensive offering that you can add as part of your overall benefit program uh, for your employees. And I want, for those of you who are thinking about, or I'm sorry, who already have these retirement plans already implemented for your company, you want to think about those four key areas. What are four, what are area, what are ways that you can actually improve upon um, and uh, maybe increase, enhance, you know, your benefit program even further? Because ultimately, as I showed you there, States are already uh, thinking ahead. They say, look, we do not want these individuals to consume more state resources. So we're going to begin to mandate employers to offer retirement plans. Listen, you as an employer have an opportunity to help your employees reduce the impact of future retirement expenses. So what we want you to do is to monitor your state legislation. I certainly didn't cover, couldn't cover all of those uh, specific state mandated areas here today, but monitor your state legislation because as I said, there's about a dozen more that um, the, the legislation is already uh, being already proposed and uh, will probably be voted on here soon. And you're going to want to monitor those state mandated plan, mandated plan requirements. But that's a cookie cutter approach to retirement plans. If you want to truly be able to customize your retirement plan to fit the needs of your company and your employees, you're going to want to look outside of the state mandated plan offerings and, and you can build something yourself. And then lastly, as you go into this, don't go into this where you've implemented your plan for your employees and you just set it and forget it, right? Um, do not do that. Please perform an annual review each and every year of your, of your plan that you offer to your employees. And it's important to focus on those four key areas, the investments, the cost, the compliance, and certainly those key deadlines that you ultimately are not going to want to forget. Um, so lastly here, you know, I, we do want you to uh, be able to consider 
Prime Pay, as I said, as I kind of started my presentation, Prime Pay has a passion for retirement plans. Um, we have put forth a very strong offering um, for employers of all sizes. Um, we offer uh, retirement plan solutions that can be as low as $30 a month, literally, uh, for an employer to adopt a retirement plan. And so it's very, very affordable. So we have a vast product offering, and it truly is customized to fit any employer's needs in this area. We have basically put together a complete retirement solution that includes prime pay, right, as the payroll provider, investment advisor, a third-party administrator, right, the TPA side, administration side, and also record-keeping side of the aisle. So it's a complete 360 degree retirement solution that we offer. And we also can provide personalized design, implementation of the plan, um, the open enrollment support, which is really critical um, to the education, right? If you're going to adopt the plan, let's get your employees informed, educated, understanding, because the more understanding, understanding that they have, they're going to be certainly more satisfied with the benefit. And ultimately, they're going to be more satisfied with the nest egg that they're building, right, um, towards their retirement. Uh, they're going to be, they're going to like to see that uh, that quarterly or you know yearly report uh, on their retirement plan. And we also provide the full monitoring and reporting for you as the employer. Uh, we provide that signature ready 5500s for year end reporting, and also daily. Uh, processing and movement of those contributions. So we ensure that those safe harbors are all taken care of for you, uh, the employer. So I have received, actually there's been many of you that have typed questions. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I might have been able to answer some of those questions as I've gone along, um, but if not, I'm going to, uh, we'll be reaching out to our subject matter experts here at PrimePay, and we'll be able to deliver the answers to your questions here uh, upon conclusion here of our webinar. Um, I want to thank you for attending the webinar here today. Uh, this has been a series of webinars that we've had here in 2019 uh, that we're going to continue here through the fall, so we hope you can join us. Uh, we have many topics that we cover throughout 2019 that are HR related, compliance related, but also uh, uh, solutions uh, related where we want to provide specific opportunities for you to consider, whether it be pre-tax benefit accounts, retirement plans, so on and so forth. We want to keep you informed here at Prime Pay. So post-webinar, you will be receiving an email from us, and in that email, there's actually going to be several things. You're going to get a link to the recording of this presentation. You're also going to receive a copy of the deck. So this presentation that I provided, you will have, okay, for your review. Maybe there were some folks within your company that were unable to attend today. So here's an opportunity for them to hear this as well. We're also going to provide a few different links. Um, and uh, we have this primepay.com forward slash 401k blog, and it's going to cover certain um, links that will have calculators, some additional tools, resources, information that would help you um, for those of you who have a retirement plan today or for those of you who are considering uh, that option here for the future. So we want to thank you uh, for our current prime paid clients. Thank you for your business here in 2019. Thank you for attending. Uh, for those of you who do not know uh, prime pay, we'd love for you to get to know us and you can reach us at primepay.com directly. You can reach us on Facebook and Twitter, actually in all those social media sites. Uh, just look for that at Prime Pay and, uh, and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. So with that, that will conclude our webinar here today. Uh, we will get answers to your questions. Uh, for those of you who posted those, have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Have a great day.